So uh, right, um, uh, I'm happy that you're here and looking forward for your presentation. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. Uh, the title of my uh, talk today is uh, How Leaving the Door Open to Building a Nuclear Weapon Strengthens Islamist Totalitarian Rule in Iran with Impacts for Inside Iran and Outside. In the first part of my talk, I will outline some of the characteristics of totalitarian rule in Iran. In the second part, I will highlight some of the implications of the regime's foreign policy for the region and the wider world. Finally, I will discuss whether there can be any solution to the current conflict. This speech will outline how the Islamist regime in Iran is using the nuclear issue to strengthen its totalitarian rule. It's the thesis of this. The world is continuously faced with new threats from the regime. It is a regime that opposes the best and the democratic demands of the Iranians themselves. My main argument is that the Iranian regime resists diplomacy as it will not deviate from its ideological goals. They will never accept, for example, to suspend the uranium enrichment program. In itself, a nuclear bomb would act as a weapon against freedom in Iranian society, since it would be a tool to stabilize the regime. Just as Khomeini needed the war of 1918 to eliminate the secular Iranian opposition in the past, today the regime is searching for ways to stabilize its dictatorship. Besides leader, Islamist ideology, totalitarian institutions and new party political system, anti-Semitism in, in the form of eliminatory and designers, gender-based persecution of, of women, anti-biased and dismantling of the independent labor movements and trade unions are characteristic of the Islamist totalitarian dictatorship. Even if one day Iran cooperates with nuclear negotiations in long term, it will not cover up the repressions of Iran. We heard today that in June there will be a new round of negotiations. The most negative aspect of the negotiations between the P5 plus 1 and Iran is the dirt of attention being paid to human rights violations in the country. Iranian nuclear activities have no relation to the suppression of religious minorities, women, human rights activists and workers. The following example demonstrates how the regime uses propaganda within Iran to mobilize potential followers. Why did the, uh, the nuclear uh, negotiations take place on 23rd May? I asked this a uh, few experts, my friends, in the, in the last days, and nobody could answer me the question. In fact, it was the Iranians who fixed the date during the negotiations in Istanbul in April 2012. The third of the Iranian months, uh, say for now, is the 23rd of May. On this day, exactly 30 years ago, Iran reoccupied the city of Khorram Shah during the Iran-Iraq war. For Iran, this day is a day of victory. Implica and now I come to the implications how they do deal it with this issue for the foreign policy. On 15th May, General Nahdi, so he is a very famous general and well known general of Iran, stated that the West's unreasonable demands will be met with another third order. This means this uh, 23rd of May. He spoke of another victory, but this time of victory over the West. And in fact, uh, unitary chief Ayatollah Saleh Amoni Narijani rejected the possibility of a compromise on the country's enrichment rights just yesterday. Since the Iranian regime insists on the peaceful character of the nuclear program, one should not forget that Iran could have ended the war with Iran after recapturing Khorramshah. 
The revolutionary aim of Khomeini was not peace, but on liberating Jerusalem, as the Islamists say, and stabilizing the dictatorship by eliminating its internal opposition. I recall how the Iranian regime instigates hate towards Israel. In March, in March of this year, Ali Khamenei again spoke of the Zionist regime as a cancerous tumor and said it has to be removed. Iranian politicians want to annihilate Israel. Fox News reported in November 2011 that Satan Hedayat Khan, he is an Iranian politician, stressed annihilation of Zionist regime in case of aggression against Iran. Um, I don't like to quote always Ahmadinejad, so some uh, rather unknown names. On 21st May 2012, a few months, a few days ago, the chief of staff of the Iranian armed forces, uh, Major General Hassan Firuz, Azad, Firuz Abadi, said that threats and pressure cannot deter Iran from its revolutionary plans. He also stressed that the Iranian nation will remain committed to the total annihilation of the Zionist regime of Israel. Firuz Abadi added, the future too we will support and help everyone who opposes the Zionist regime. And there are in fact some evidences for the expanding nuclear weapon program. Iran's defense ministry controls and operates research and development, and there are reports which depict Iran's secret military nuclear testing sites in Parchi. <coughs> And just on 23rd May, two days ago, two days ago, it was reported that the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran announced that the country's experts have placed homemade fuel plates into the heart of the Tehran research reactor. Another act which cannot really be seen as an exercise in confidence building was the announcement of the launch of three experimental by satellites in this year. The problem is that these satellites can also be used for launching conventional or nuclear bombs. Let me give you another example. One should keep in mind how the Iranian regime uses peaceful civilian speedboats for military proposals. The general of the Iranian Navy, Ali Fadri, announced on 15 May 2012 that Iran is the only country in the world capable of building and using armed speedboats from which missiles can be launched. And just on 23rd May, it was reported that the Iranian army plans to unveil and put into the operation Iran's first homemade Cobra chopper in special war games of the Army's airborne unit in the near future. Returning to the problem of terrorism, new theories on this, for example from Thomas Steinmetz, define terrorist activities as small wars, like In any case, Iran does not recognize what we should call, we would call, terrorists as terrorists today, uh, but instead sees it as a heroic act of Islamic liberation. In practice, this means that Iran trains, funds, guides, and supports terrorist organizations. Iran could one day engage in the distribution of briefcase dirty bombs to terrorist groups like Hamas and Jihad Islam. We know today that the Revolutionary Guards have even supported the Syrian faction of Al Qaeda in recent years, as Guido Steinberg of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs has highlighted. Under international law, the propaganda of war is forbidden. But the Iranian regime persists in continuously spreading war propaganda. What they understand as Islamic liberation, we understand as terrorism. Iran has a policy of putting itself forward as the hegemonic power in the Islamic world. In fact, there is a cold war between Iran and Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and United Arab Emirates. According to Iran's state ideology, peace in the Islamic world is only possible if Iran acts as the role model for the entire Islamic world. Iranian state doctrine will never recognize Israel and the Western democracies since they believe 
only in their own totalitarian ideology. This blend of religious belief and politics results in the creation of a third form of totalitarian ideology, Iranian Islamism. This makes a nuclear bomb a danger for the Iranian, for Iranians themselves, as well as for the whole world. Without God, merely keeping open the possibility of building the bomb increases Iran's destructive power and influence. According to Hans Brüder, who is a well-known German military expert who has worked with the German uh, defense ministry, Iran has even tested the nuclear bomb in North Korea. Therefore, NATO is compelled to provide a missile defense shield. Let us assume that Iran possesses a nuclear cap capability and there is a situation of mutually assumed destruction in AD. Would Iran modify its totalitarian goals and give up supporting the Islamist organizations and supporting anti western dictatorships? Of course not. It would embolden its policy and supporting terrorist movements and the bomb would simply become a tool of blackmailing global diplomacy as it is doing even without it. According to Article 6 of Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, genocide means, and this is my last part of my talk, last part of my talk, uh, genocide means any act of killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, and deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destructions in whole or in part. In Article 7, crimes against uh, humanity is defined as acts of widespread or systematic violence directed at any civilian population, including murder, enforced uh, disappearance of persons, persecution and imprisonment, or other civil deprivations of physical liberty in violence of fundamental rules of international law. In this context, persecution refers to the intention, intentional suppression of fundamental rights contrary by international law by reason of the identity of the group or collective. Also, according to the Rome Statute, enforced disappearance of persons means the arrest, detention, or, or an abduction of persons by or with the authorization, support, or acquiescence of a state or political organizations. Both Article 6 and 7 to the situation of the Baha'i community in Iran in terms of genocide. The uh, um, applies to it and the threat of terrorist attack and all out war on Israel also have a genocidal ideology and policy. Europe should pay more heed to the Europe uh, to the Rome Statute of the uh, International Criminal Court and not allow state sponsored genocide in the 21st century. Even if the totalitarian regime cooperates in nuclear uh, negotiations, the massive problems in relation to the repression of Iran, Iranians, and the exportation of terrorists remain. The Iranian nuclear program is but one of the problems involving the so called Islamic Republic of Iran. Not only must the building of a nuclear bomb be stopped, but also the totalitarian dictatorship itself. The Iranian regime is ultima irrational society, suicidal, as it demonstrates by training the Basij and suicidal terrorist groups. This means that in the long term, this religiously legitimized form of totalitarianism will become more dangerous. This escapes the comprehension of some captains of industry who see the world only in terms of their own short-term market interests. The world needs the European Missile Shield, even though budgets around the world are feeling the squeeze in the current economic climate. Islamic totalitarianism remains a challenge in the 21st century. I must confess that I don't know what will happen in the future.
I assume that the Islamic Republic of Iran will not be the final chapter in Iranian history. However, we can learn from the history of other states. Dictatorships collapsed because of their ineffectiveness, as a result of violent or peaceful revolutions, or as a result of war. It is highly unlikely that the, Iran, that the leader of Iran will wake up one day and tell Iranians that everything he has done until now has been a mistake. I mean, this is a joke. Uh, the Iranian people certainly suffered under a totalitarian rule, which is very uh, repressive. I have to admit that I hope for a secular parliamentary, a parliamentary democracy for Iran, as I believe that Iranians have the right to live in freedom. Maybe one day the Islamic Republic of Iran will get history. Then, the Iranian Greens could debate whether Iran has any need for nuclear energy at all, seeing as there is plenty of sun in the deserts and more than enough wine, gas and oil to fulfill their energy needs. Thank you for your attention. So, thank you, Wahid, for your statement. And now I'm looking forward to the statement by uh, Michael Rubin. I'm very happy and also proud that he's here. He's uh, one of the leading experts on Iran in uh, the US. Uh, he's a uh, resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. And um, he teaches and taught history at various universities, including Yale and including uh, some places in the Middle East, like Israel and at three universities in Iraq, so very close to Iran. Um, he himself even lived in Iran and he's uh, one of the editors of a more or less daily newsletter, like a press uh, roundup. So he very well knows not only the debates and uh, discussions that are going on in Washington, but he also really knows uh, what the Iranian press and uh, regime and people are thinking, and so I'm very uh, excited what you have to tell us. Thank you very much. I apologize that we have to do today's session in English, but you know that old saying that someone who speaks three languages is trilingual, someone who speaks two languages is bilingual, and someone that speaks one language is American. <laughs> now, I work and hang my hat at a think tank in Washington, D.C. The American Enterprise Institute. One of the drawbacks about being at a think tank in Washington, D.C. is especially when one is under a deadline. That's when you get called by the television station to go on Fox or CNN and give your 17 seconds of wisdom about whatever the problem in the world is that day. And I recently did that, and I came back to the television green room, the waiting room, and the person who was going to be up next was a governor of one of the American states and he had a whole entourage. I don't have an entourage. At any rate, one of the governor's aides looked up and said, hey, I thought you looked good up there. And I said, that's kind of funny because my wife had just texted me and said, Michael, I thought you looked fat, bald, and mean. The governor looked up from his notes and said, I didn't think you looked mean. <laughs> the point of that is, during questions and answers, no matter how mean I might look, I hope that we can have a real debate. The last preamble I want to say is that I'm trained as a historian, which means I get paid to predict the past. And usually I get that right about 50% of the time. When I approach this issue, I'm going to approach it slightly different than the Wahid, but come to much the same conclusions, because I want to actually take a historical approach about the way the Iranians are approaching diplomacy and the way the Iranians are outlining their strategy as we move forward. Too often, at least in Washington, when diplomats sit down, we sit down, as do European diplomats, with a great deal of sincerity about resolving a problem. But we need to understand, and I, I say this as someone who came out of 14 years in a Quaker school, of all things, where I was taught that multiculturalism was always good. It was always about appreciating each other's differences. It was about the ability to go into a sushi restaurant and order a mojito. But ultimately, we need to recognize that the core of multiculturalism is recognizing that different peoples think in very different ways. 
Western diplomacy developed out of the Enlightenment and evolved through the Congress of Vienna and so forth, but while we impose our diplomatic system on the outside world through gunboat diplomacy and so forth, and certainly the British landed in Bushir in 1856 during the Anglo-Persian War um, of that year, it would be naive to say, and it would be actually quite culturally arrogant to say, that the Iranians, the Chinese, and others will approach diplomacy in the same way we do. If we read Machiavelli at times, who himself later in life became a diplomat, the Iranians will read Nizam al Siyasat Namen, and it is a different route. Sometimes the end result is the same, but sometimes perhaps the thinking is not the same. Now, when we ask the basic question, does Iran want the bomb? Why do they want nuclear power? There's a great deal of suspicion, and there's good reason for the suspicion. First of all, Iranians will say that they want to have a nuclear energy program, they want a completely indigenous energy supply. Iran has uranium, it mines it naturally, and at the same time, the Iranians will say, the Iranian government, that is, that they want to have an indigenous energy supply, energy security, they want eight reactors just to protect, produce electricity. Well, if one calculates their uranium reserves, which are well known, and enriches that to low enriched uranium, what one finds is one can power eight nuclear reactors for 15 years. And as what he had said, that with just a for about one-third the price, they could develop other sources of energy that would power their country for much more than 15 years. So this raises a great deal of suspicion. Of course, living in the United States, having been involved in working in the Pentagon from 2002 to 2004 during the Iraq War, and instead, in, in addition, spending too much of my life in Iraq, in Baghdad, in Najaf, and so forth, what I would argue is, I mean, what often comes up is that, well, the intelligence was all faulty back with regard to Iraq, and Iran is just a replay of this. But there's an important difference here as well, that with regard to Iraq, different countries, including the German government, the American government, and so forth, were, were relying on intelligence which turned out to be flawed. With regard to the situation in Iran, all the problems which have been determined have come out of inspections which the IAEA has conducted and Iranian inconsistencies with regard to their explanations to inspectors and IAEA officials. Now, one of the other issues before I go into the Iranian strategy that I want to look at would be the difference between a nuclear weapon itself, and I don't personally believe the Iranians have made the decision to acquire a nuclear weapon, and a nuclear weapon capability. This has become a big question, whether Iran just wants the ability to put together a nuclear weapon, but whether we can rest assured that they haven't made the decision to do so. After all, Japan is a nuclear weapons capable state, but they are not a nuclear weapons power. The difference between a nuclear weapons capability and it being a nuclear weapons state is about two weeks. And the question which policymakers need to ask is if Iran crosses that threshold to become a nuclear weapons capable power, whether we have the intelligence on the ground to act in the two weeks after which, they, after they make the decision, and then during which time they would put together, um, presumably and theoretically, a bomb. Now, there's other reasons for suspicion about Iranians' nuclear um, ambitions and what their ultimate goal is. Currently, diplomats are suggesting, well, the Supreme Leader of Iran has issued a fatwa which forbids the, the, the possession and the use of nuclear weapons. The interesting thing is, when one looks at the Supreme Leader's webpage, where his fatwas are replicated in Persian, in Turkish, in Hassa, Indonesian, in all sorts of languages, that fatwa actually isn't written on his webpage anywhere. Some people say, well, it's an oral fatwa, it's not a written fatwa. But if so, and if it's going to become the basis of negotiation, it makes sense to actually have an idea of what he actually said in response to this, this question. And otherwise, one's in a situation where we've been in before with the Middle East peace process where certain people will say something to one audience and say something quite different to another audience. We, we need to make sure that if the Iranians are quite serious about a prohibition on nuclear weapons, 
they should at least be willing to write this down on paper. Now, when it comes to other quotes, and there's that famous quote on December 14, 2001, by Hashmi Rafsanjani on Food's Day, in which he suggested that Israel, that Iran, all it needs is one bomb to destroy Israel, and even if Israel retaliated, Iran's much bigger, it could weather the storm. That some people will argue that that's not what Rafsanjani meant, that it was taken out of context. The interesting thing here, and the ironic thing is, while many American congressmen will argue it was taken out of context, many members of the Iranian Majlis chastised Rafsanjani for such nuclear brinkmanship. But more importantly, in 2005, Bajat al-Islam and Ola Reza Hassani, who was the Supreme Leader's personal representative to West Azerbaijan, the West Azerbaijan Friday Prayer Leader, also declared that Iran's goal would be to get a bond. Now, any of you who follow Iran closely know that Hassani has a very funny reputation, that many people consider him a blowhard, but at the same time, he is a direct appointee of the Supreme Leader, whose charge is to give the basically the weekly official speech in this important province. There's been other cases as well. Um, Muhammad, Ayatollah Mohammed Bakr Harazi was quoted, he's the General Secretary of Iranian Hezbollah by Iran and Ruz, as saying, we are able to produce atomic bombs and we will do just that. We shouldn't be afraid of anyone. The U.S. is no more than a barking dog. And Ruz, a, a fairly reformist website, close to the Islam, I mean, in the Islamic Republic, quoted Mohsin um, Garabia, a Kung theologian, close to Muhammad Taqi Mezbayazdi, as also saying that Iran's ultimate goal would be to create a nuclear weapon. Long story short, we can believe certain diplomats, we can believe certain religious figures, but there's enough contradictory statements out there that it would be academically dishonest and diplomatically dishonest to simply cherry pick what we want to hear at the, exclu at the exclusion of what we don't want to hear. Certainly it appears, at least in certain circles, there's a debate about what Iran, Iran's ultimate goal should be. Now when it comes to Iranian strategy, the Iranian decision-making, without a doubt, is more or less monopolized in the office of the Supreme Leader, the Supreme Leader himself, and arguably, over the course of the last three years or so, you really had the rise of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iranian politics. Many people who don't follow Iran closely think of the Islamic Republic as a cleric, um, as a state that is run by clerics. But the fact of the matter is, there is only one minister in the cabinet who is a member of the clergy, the intelligence minister, and we have to put an asterisk next to his name because his job was actually as the chaplain to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The, the regime is increasingly dominated by the Revolutionary Guard. I'll get to the importance of that when it comes to the nuclear program in a minute. That said, when we talk about Iranian political factionalization, even though the Majlis, the President, and many of the ministers don't have as much power, or effective power, as the Supreme Leader does, that doesn't mean that one doesn't have very vicious debates between the various political factions. And take politicians in any country, and you're going to be able to have a, a great deal of hot air. Well, in this case, what's quite interesting was a debate which occurred at the University of Milan before the 2000, I believe actually a year before the 2009 elections. And it was between Abdullah Ramazanzadeh, who was Mohammed Khatami, the former quote-unquote reformist president's spokesman, and a proxy for Ahmadinejad, the current president. What Ramazan Zadda had said was, your strategy is all wrong. Ahmadinejad is doing a horrible job. All this Holocaust revisionism and denial, all this threats to eliminate Israel, to annihilate it, to wipe it from the pages of time, whatever you want to call it, that what you're doing is all, all this messianic rhetoric, this talk of the hidden imam. What's wrong with Ahmadinejad? Ramazan Zadda said, because all you're doing is uniting the West against you. Instead of, I mean, all they're, and they're, they're imposing sanctions on you. Well, what Ramazan Zadda said you should do is what we did back under Muhammad Khatam. Have a dialogue of civilizations. And as long as the West is talking, 
Then they're not imposing sanctions, and we can import all that we need for our projects. That was pretty damning admission. At the same time, just this past October, Hassan Rouhani, who was Iran's nuclear negotiator in the last years of Mohammad Khatami, gave an interview to the Iranian newspaper Etama, which is available online. In this newspaper, he was defending himself against many hardliners who suggested that he had somehow betrayed Iran by back during the Khatami administration, agreeing with the Europeans to suspend enrichment. He argued in response that it was a brilliant tactical move that achieved three things, or had three logical bases to it. Number one, he wanted to delay, I mean, to divide the Americans from the Europeans and prevent sanctions at the United Nations. It's always interesting the lengths that the Iranians go to to prevent sanctions while at the same time saying that sanctions have absolutely no impact. Obviously, their actions suggest otherwise. He also said that by agreeing to suspend enrichment ourselves, that we can also determine the end date and the return of enrichment. And then he went back to Ahmadinejad's proxies and said, on top of which, when we were suspending enrichment, we had to suspend it anyway because we needed to install more centrifuges. And therefore, we took advantage of this delay and got diplomatic credit for it. And one of the interesting things in Iran right now is this debate with regards to the nuclear program about who deserves the credit for the Iranian victory, the reformists, the pragmatists, or the hardliners. Now, oftentimes, when we are sitting down for diplomacy, we will, let me put this way, when the military, whether it's the German military, the American military, or whomever, has an operation in Afghanistan or does exercises, they spend much more time looking over and examining the lessons learned and what their mistakes were and whether they achieved their aims or not. And they study it for years and years and years in military academies. But seldom do diplomats, be they in Europe or the United States, ever conduct similar lessons learned exercises. If we go back to Klaus Kinkel, for example, and the whole idea of critical dialogue, which, after Khatami's election, morphed into this idea of critical engagement, there was this belief that by reaching out to Iran, by engaging with them, by trading with them, that we could really bring them to the table, there would still be some critical aspects to the dialogue, but this is how you moderate Iran. Now, it's actually interesting, when we look at the IAEA records, there's a great debate now about whether or not Iran's objectives are just an energy cycle or whether the program has a military component. But what the IAEA records are pretty conclusive about is before 2003, Iran was experimenting with things like weapons, triggers, and so forth that had everything to do with the military program, nothing to do with an energy cycle. This was the time of the critical engagement and the critical dialogue which suggests that while we were talking with the Iranians, the behavior within the government was actually far different. And we need to actually determine as we move ahead with dialogue, and this is something which comes into play today and right now, whether the, we expect the Iranian behavior to be different than what it was before. Albert Einstein, of course, famously defined insanity as conducting the same actions repeatedly but expecting different results from them. I mean, in this case, the actions have been pretty consistent. I, I won't be so politically incorrect to label diplomats insane. What I would say, being politically incorrect, is it reminds me, if I made an analogy, to a gambler who's at a blackjack table. You can lose any number of rounds of blackjack and still convince yourself that if I can just stay in for one more round, I'm going to recoup all my losses. But as we know, the House always wins. That doesn't mean that diplomacy cannot succeed. I personally am, an oppo I am opposed to military action in Iran. But as a historian, I want to know where diplomacy has succeeded in the past. There are two primary um, incidents, one of which will he um, address. The first was the American hostage crisis, and the second was the Iran-Iraq war. Now, there were any number of diplomatic approaches to Iran during the hostage crisis. 
And there's the German Channel, the PLO Channel, the UN Channel, Ramsey Clark's Channel, and finally the Algiers Channel, which succeeded in releasing the hostages. And many Carter administration diplomats will say it was the persistence of diplomacy which mattered. However, Peter Rodman, who recently passed away from leukemia, one of the most brilliant strategic minds out there, said no, we're ignoring an important factor. In September 1980, Saddam Hussein invaded Iran. And therefore, the cost of Iran's isolation caused by holding the hostages had suddenly become too great to bear. And that's why Khomeini agreed to release the hostages, short of all the aims and short of fulfillment of all of its demands. Now, I'm very happy that Lahid brought up the fact that in 1982, the Iranians could have ended the Iran-Iraq war. If you follow Iranian historiography, this has been one of the main themes which oftentimes isn't addressed in the West. Lots of documents have been released that suggest that once the Iranians more or less pushed back the assault, that Khomeini was considering ending the war then. Many who became the more ideological components within the Revolutionary Guard said, no, you've got to keep pushing, you've got to keep pushing to meet our full objectives, and Khomeini agreed to that. But six years later, Khomeini realized that, I mean, a half million more people died and the cost was too great to bear. So he got on television and the radio and basically said, this is drink, like drinking a chalice of poison, but I have no choice but to accept the ceasefire. The question which we need to be asking ourselves as we pursue diplomacy is how can we isolate Iran, as in 1981, and how can we increase the costs of their actions to the point that they will conclude that persisting along this path would be like drinking a chalice of poison. Now, I said that I wanted to go into the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps for a minute, and so I will. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is increasingly consolidating power in Iran. Never before have there been so many people within the hierarchy, within the parliament, within the ministries, deputy ministries, um, governorships, deputy governorships, who are veterans of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. One of the reasons why Iran is so hard to predict is it's not the official wire diagram that matters, it's the unofficial battle buddy informal network of who served with whom during the Iran-Iraq war that, from which decisions are really made. But when I was in graduate school, one of the things I would always be punished for is if I wrote in a paper, Iran said this, Iran did that, the United States responded this way, or so forth, because the, uh, the professor would say that is too imprecise. You need to say who did this, who said it. So when we're talking about Iran's potential nuclear program, we're really talking, in effect, about the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Force nuclear program, because it would be, if Iran developed nuclear weapons, it would be the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which would have the command, control, and custody of that nuclear arsenal. Not only would it be the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, because that's not a monolithic entity, but it would be the most hardline, ideologically pure element within the IRGC. Now, if there's a succession, if, I mean, if Khamenei dies, that basically means that this IRGC unit would have veto power over the next selection, informally because they're not going to subordinate themselves to someone with whom they disagree. So you can't hope for reformism after Khamenei. At the same time, it also means that deterrence may not work. And here's the reason why. I don't think that Iran is going to develop a nuclear weapon in the next day drop on Israel. I worry about Iran becoming overconfident about um, its using it as a deterrent and lashing out conventionally, but I don't think they're just going to drop on Israel. And a lot of diplomats will tell themselves that Iran isn't a suicidal entity. And therefore, they're not going to use nuclear weapons anyway. But there's, what if you have a situation like in 2009, where you have an uprising, but this time, the Revolutionary Guard joins in. And so, like 1989 with Ceausescu in Romania, or like the last days of Gaddafi, where you have a popular uprising, the security forces defend, what happens in a situation where the regime only has about 12 hours left to, to survive? And when Gaddafi lost control of Tripoli, how did his forces react? In the last hours of the regime, they just kept launching Scud missiles at the Strata out of sheer and utter spite. We need to ask whether the Iran, if Iran, in its last moments, 
and I'll conclude here so we have time for Q and A. Decided to, I mean, if the regime was collapsing and this unit of the Revolutionary Guard decided to launch, whether Israel, the United States, Europe would retaliate against a country which already had regime change? And the answer to that is, is no. So I'm not sure that deterrence is very possible. Now, I said that I'm not interested in a military strike against Iran, and the reason for that is it's really only going to delay the issue. Because if, we, if it delays the program for two or three years, what's going to happen after two or three years? And are you simply going to bomb Iran every two or three years? At the same time, there's a lot of negatives which I don't want to enunciate with regard to any military campaign against Iran, because everyone already knows them and agrees with them. And the, all sorts of rallying people around the flag, um, a, a, a cascade of proliferation, all sorts of issues. So what else can we do besides raising the cost of diplomatic and economic pressure? Sanctions can be much more effective than they are now, and we know how the Iranians avoid sanctions. And we know, for example, about um, when the Iranians talk about privatization. In reality, what's going on is we're taking state-owned industries, selling them on the Tehran Stock Exchange, where they get bought by the IRGC front company or a bank, an IRGC bank, and then the operations of the sanctions company get shifted to that one. It's, it's anti-sanctions three-card monthly. There's other issues we can do. I, I'm really glad that we spoke earlier about independent trade unions. I think one of the tragedies of the last decade is that for the first time, Iran had developed an independent trade union, a left lens a moment, not with the shipyard workers in the dance, but with the bus drivers in Tehran. And both the United States and the Europeans ignored it. But ultimately, if you want to get the Iranian government accountable to its people, you really have to develop this accountability mechanism that comes with independent trade unions. And one would think, especially among the European left, that this would be a natural. And don't tell me that if you support Iranian unions, the Iranians are just going to accuse them of taking foreign money. Because even if you don't support Iranian unions, the Iranians are going to accuse them of supporting Iranian money. So they at least should get something for their accusations. There's other issues we can do. I mean, some of you know UltraSurf, which is developed uh, by Chinese dissidents to avoid firewalls. It doesn't even need to be installed on computers. It can run off a memory stick. And what we find is for every $10 million in servers that we, we, get, um, we provide in order so that Chinese people can avoid firewalls inside China or Syrians or Libyans or Vietnamese and so forth, and Iranians, the Chinese have to spend about $100 million to restore the firewall. So if we were to support $500, $500 million worth of servers so that you can have rapid use of the internet against firewalls, $5 billion remembers the official budget of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. It would be nice to make the Iranians spend that money on something other than ballistic missiles. There's any number of other issues we can talk about, but we really should get to the debate. So with that, I've already proven that I'm part historian, part academic, because I've been so long-winded. But let's conclude, and then maybe we can have a good discussion. Thank you. So, thank you, Mike, for your presentation. Um, I'll, I'll just keep it a little bit uh, here on the podium, but uh, you will have the opportunity to speak in a, in a second. Um, so, I got so many notes here, but where should we begin? Maybe um, just um, continue where you, where you were speaking. Um, isn't there some kind of contradiction? On the one hand, everyone uh, I guess should agree that the best solution would be to get rid of this regime and have a kind of free democratic society in Iran. So this is, would be the perfect solution, but the question really is, is it a solution to the nuclear crisis? If you look at all the red lines and ticking clocks, etc., etc., that maybe we can talk about later. So while in the long term this would be the best solution, uh, aren't we caught in a dilemma that to get this uh, very uh, uh, current and pressing crisis with the nuclear program, uh, program somehow resolved with the regime? So in the end, what what we have to do is 
and you uh, proposed it, and uh, is to really increase the pressure to a point where the regime sees no other chance but to uh, give in. But on the other hand, they, uh, they want something in return. So if they give up the nuclear program, well, there's something the West would have to give to this regime, like um, ending the sanctions, etc., etc. So giving uh, uh, the regime more lifetime, and which also would be some way of you know prolonging the problem because well maybe they will agree to something, but then there will be doubts that they are uh, reality continuing their program. So isn't there um, a contradiction between? Um, diplomacy on the one hand and the uh, goal of regime change on the other hand. Okay, that, that, very good questions. Now, ultimately, if I'm going to criticize diplomacy much more specifically, I'd argue that both the Europeans and the Americans have been very bad at the issues of setting the right circumstances to creating the most leverage. The, you're absolutely right that if the Iranians give up their nuclear programs, if they suddenly find themselves in adherence to the United Nations Security Council resolutions, which demand they to stop suspending, uh, stop enriching uranium, then there would be no reason for the sanctions. That said, I agree that we shouldn't throw a lifeline to the regime by giving them all sorts of other incentives which might prolong their life. You can still support independent trade union movements and to try to make the regime much more accountable to its people, Ultimately, the regime is an anomaly, I argue, in Iranian history, rather than necessarily the natural apex of Iranian political evolution. Now, the other issue I want to bring up here is one of the hats I wear back in the United States is I also teach at the Naval Postgraduate School, and whenever an aircraft carrier goes to the Persian Gulf, I'll usually go with it for about two, um, two weeks. And when I'm talking to American servicemen, the way they, the way they conceive of and the way they're taught strategy is that every strategy should have a diplomatic and informational, a military and an economic component. Military doesn't mean bombing. Military could mean containment, defending the other side, having the, um, and a sign that if diplomacy doesn't work, there's something worse to come. One of the ways that it, it may still be controversial, that the Cold War ended, before Reagan sat down with Gorbachev, which he didn't hesitate to do, he had a bit of a military buildup ahead of time, so that Gorbachev actually thought he might actually use the military. Now, the last thing I would say is time is running out for other reasons. I used to say when I would lecture that I wanted to talk about demography in Iran, but everyone would fall asleep. So instead, what I want to promise to talk about briefly right now is sex in Iran. One of the first things Ayatollah Khomeini did when he led the Islamic Revolution was to ban contraception. And as Farhad Qasimi at the University of Connecticut has written about, posters went up that showed a good Iranian family with a mother, a father, and seven children. And Khomeini used to say, when people would say, look, what are you doing? We, our economy is a shattered. We have war, we have revolution, and now we have this baby boom. Khomeini used to wave them off and say, we didn't have a revolution over the price of a water bottle. But by 1988, he determined that you could. So posters went back up, a mother, a father, and one child. Now, what does this mean today? When you actually think back on the 2009 uprising, who was out in the street? Now, keep in mind, the birth rate today in Iran is half of what it was in the 1980s. When you do the math, the people who came out on the street were in their 20s. They represented the, the apex of that Iranian-Iraq war baby. And when you look at the discussion in Sobi Saba, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Force Weekly, for example, they're very cognizant of the fact that while the West makes an assumption that once the genie of reform is out of the bottle, it can't be put back in, what the IRGC counts on is that every year they can hold on to power, there's going to be many more Iranians who settle down, start families, and all the young students, the uppity students, the political activists, there's going to be fewer and fewer of them each year, which means it's going to be much easier to hold on to power. So ultimately, I fully agree that we can't throw a lifeline to the regime. At the same time, we need to rep understand that the Iranian regime, when they sit down and engage in diplomacy, may very much be trying to run out the clock, not just on the nuclear bomb, but on their own internal vulnerabilities. So let me stop there and
Um, very short. Uh, we can go uh, to history again. Uh, there were 100 years ago, about 100 years ago, uh, a contradiction between two Iranian Muslim intellectuals, Abdul and Afghani. One wanted to educate the Muslim society, and the other, and then fight the colonial uh, system. And his friend and colleague. Uh, he said, no, uh, we can't do it without education. Uh, we have this problem today, uh, in my eyes. Um, the the uh, contradictions between Khatami and uh, the so-called reformers and hardliners. The one, if they go to the, as want, want to make diplomacy and speak with foreign uh, diplomats, they say, we try to convince them that we are right. They never uh, go as an open uh, thinker, uh, what we know it from here. I mean, this is the uh, difference between an ideologue and an uh, open mind uh, uh, person. So, therefore, uh, I would even say that um, fundamentalists uh, are not able to make real dialogue because they are only uh, pursuing the monologues. Uh, and uh, even in the theories of uh, fundamentalist theories, uh, you, uh, you can read it that fundamentalists are always doing monologues. So, uh, and so far, diplomacy is in fact very difficult. Okay, um, maybe just one more question from my side. Um, I mean, we, we had some a little bit different uh, concepts here. You spoke about totalitarianism and you mentioned cultural differences. Um, maybe this is also something we can talk about later, but uh, when we stick to your theory that uh, Iran is a totalitarian regime, uh, it should mean that Europeans should have some understanding of it because, uh, you know, we, we had these regimes here in uh, Europe, of course, and but um, a recent case shows that there seems hardly any understanding of the nature of such a regime. And I want to um, mention a case that is especially important here in Germany, the case of the Iranian uh, musician uh, who fled Iran and now lives in Germany, Shahin Nachafi, against whom uh, right now there have been four, not only one, but uh, in the meantime four death fatwas um, wanting him dead because he um, made a song that in a satirical way referred to one of the Shiite uh, hidden uh, or uh, former Imams, the 10th Imam. Um, so what was happened is basically that there was this fatwa and then there, the news popped up on some uh, news agencies in Iran that you know this, this person should die and there would be a uh, uh, reward of one hundred thousand a dollar uh, uh, for the one who kills him. So this happens two weeks before the uh, next round of um, nuclear talks. So uh, when, you, when we look at what was written in the German press about it, there were some reports, but they were just reporting. There was not one. I, I can remember not one really comment that was somehow outraged, or not one really analyzes that sees this as part of the foreign policy of Iran. So I'm uh, mainly asking you, right, um, is it just some crazy Ayatollah and some media that are doing this, or is this an Iranian maneuver? And yes, um, who, who would have interest in um, confronting one state, in this case Germany, uh, which is member of the P5 plus 1 group, with uh, two, two weeks ahead of these negotiations by um, mainly uh, uh, uttering a death sentence against uh, someone who lives here on, on China territory. Uh, yes, it is fun for diplomacy. No, um, um, but perhaps it is a form of fun for diplomacy. Uh, I uh, recall uh, that many Iranian politicians insist that Iran doesn't want nuclear weapons because of the fatwa of Khamenei. So, but if we look at it, uh, and I 
really was busy with it for a few weeks. Um, um, normally, Ayatollah Khamenei and our uh, Ayatollahs have their list of fatwas, and you can go and read where are the fatwas, and uh, there is always a question, and then the answer with the date, and stand, What did Khamenei do? Khamenei spoke in some of his speeches that, yes, the nuclear weapon is Palestine. So, okay. uh, I mean, Khamenei, uh, when he lived, he spoke of emancipation, of democracy, and freedom, everything. So, uh, and uh, they uh, learned uh, in a way how they do, <laughs> with uh, uh, in a way how they did want to do it, uh, to deal with it. Um, and we know what they did with women, with democracy, and so on. Uh, the same thing is, uh, in my eyes, uh, uh, that uh, Khamenei never said or wrote something in, in regard to the nuclear question. What could be a fact for? Even if you read the Khomeini's writings, Khomeini said, I have said, that a fatwa, that the believer, that the Muslim has only to follow a fatwa if it's for sure a fatwa. If he does that it is fatwa, he doesn't need to follow it. This is what Khomeini wrote. This is part of his faith, of his religious law, of his dissertation, uh, of having a faith. Um, and, um, and the other side is that new fatwas, they are real fatwas of Mr. Uh, Safi uh, Golpaikani and Makarim Shirazi. They were asked, and they answered concretely in two sentences that, and this is very interesting, uh, first, at a great, and they are great actors, they are uh, in a religious uh, position higher than what Khamenei is very important. Uh, uh, first, uh, Golpaikani was asked, and uh, I have all the texts and answers of both cases, uh, what would you do if somebody in, in, uh, in a foreign country would insult the Imams or the Prophet? Of course, as Khomeini said, and they referred to Khomeini, uh, they have to be killed. They are apostates, they don't say they have to be killed. They say they are apostates and everybody knows that an apostate has to be killed. In the second case, of uh, Ayatollah, great Ayatollah Shirazi, Makarem Shirazi, um, it got more concrete. Uh, he was asked, especially with the name of Mr. Najafi, what we have some person who is, his name is Najafi, he lives in Germany, and he said this and that. And then again, he answered, yes, everybody who exalts the Imams and the Muslim. Um, what the others do then, the revolutionary guards uh, do with such a uh, judgment, it is the second step. So the Ayatollahs, uh, they remain always very general in their statements. So, uh, in my eyes, it was, um, it cannot be an incident that one week before this, uh, uh, this negotiations, which determined the Iranian history somehow, uh, that uh, this fatwa story came again. So uh, I think it is uh, intentional that they want to scare the, their own people and to warn the Iranians outside and warn the world. And it is a sort of warning to say, if somebody insults us, we can kill everybody. It is a form of a warning. Okay, so Michael can just very briefly. Um, certainly it creates strategic confusion and these contradictory messages, and this is a common practice, especially ahead, there's an added to this, ahead of major episodes of diplomacy so that different people can find different things in, um, in the symbolism as Iran moves forward. But let's assume for a second that the Iranian government is sincere in its engagement and that these fatwas were issued as spoilers. Let's, let's just challenge that assumption for a second. One of those issues that makes me, gets me very frustrated when I read the Iranian press or when I look at Iranian diplomacy 
is that when the president of Senegal or the president of Malawi or the prime minister of Eritrea comes to Iran to meet with the Iranians, they meet with the supreme leader. And yet, on an issue which arguably to us is of much greater concern than an issue that's relating to agricultural dealing in Eritrea, we meet with perhaps the head of the Supreme National Security Council or the deputy foreign minister or, or someone like that, but we meet at a very low level. If the Iranians are very serious about diplomacy moving forward, why is it that the Supreme Leader refuses out of hand to meet with European officials or with, let alone, the great safety of American officials? And ultimately, if you're going to have a lasting decision on agreement, diplomacy should rely upon those per people who have the power to make the agreement, rather than simply playing this game of, well, maybe yes, maybe no, which I would agree with um, which I would say is what the backbone of some of the strategic confusion is. And we're saying, yeah, we're just telling, I mean, the symbolism is we're just telling the Europeans that diplomacy is okay, and when you have a fatwa like this, it's reassuring the hardline base, don't worry, we haven't really changed. Okay, so um, maybe just one question here, since you also wrote about uh, diplomacy and the rogue regimes, what would you recommend as a reaction to this? I mean, the, the current reaction from the German government is nothing. First, uh, uh, pol police told this uh, young man that he uh, better, uh, should leave the country. Um, but okay, they gave him some security, obviously, now. Uh, hopefully, but I haven't heard any statement from any um, uh, person who's of real importance. There have two members, uh, one or two members of the parliament who said something, but from the government, nothing. I think the situation right now is more dangerous than it's been in a quarter century. And the reason is this. Wars in the Middle East are not caused by oil, and they're not caused by water. They're caused fundamentally by an overconfidence. The when I'm on American aircraft carriers, what I'm told is that the incidence of Iranian small boat harassment of aircraft carriers have increased exponentially in the last six months or so. The most ever spent, after 1988, after we had our naval engagement, so-called Operation Prime Mantis, the red line was established and the Iranians more or less stayed out of our way for 25 years. Likewise, after the Mykonos uh, Cafe incident and the verdict, the Iranians learned that there were certain lines which they shouldn't cross when it came to not only Germany, but Europe. Now, the most dangerous thing in American policy, and I'd argue Western policy more generally, is this, and it, it's a bipartisan problem. I'm not picking on President Obama or President Bush. It's that there's a tremendous gap between rhetoric and reality. And when this gap grows too large between rhetoric and reality, one loses a great deal of credibility. We had a research assistant at the American Enterprise Institute go back and count the number of red lines which the Bush administration and the Obama administration had issued to Iran. Red lines by things like, if there's not an agreement to suspend en enrichment by the time of the G20 summit in Pittsburgh, there will be crippling sanctions. And the G20 summit comes and goes, there's not crippling sanctions. There have been more than 30 different occasions when we have declared red lines and not fulfilled them, which means arguably that the Revolutionary Guard and those surrounding the Supreme Leader who know, have no concept, have never really lived in the West, have never really interacted with Westerners, don't fully understand how Westerners think, may believe that they can push harder than they actually can. I'm not worried about a proactive American airstrike on Iran. I'm much more worried about an Iranian miscalculation that will bring with it a reaction that's going to spin out of control. The final point I'll make on this, with regard to the biggest takeaway, being that the Germans need to make clear somehow that this is completely unacceptable, perhaps by closing some Iranian consulates um, or other methods such as that. You know, one of the problems of jet lag is I was about to say something extremely brilliant. And I just completely blanked on what it was, but I can guarantee you that at 4 a.m. it will come back to me. So let me just leave it there and turn the floor over. Closer to conflict, maybe. So if so, 
why shouldn't we try to involve Iran in the international system, for example, through a regional security architecture, a new one, involving the GCC states uh, as well as Israel, ensuring mutual security agreements? Um, a, a few quick answers to that. First of all, the concept, while I take your point with regard to the regional, new regional security apparatus, there is a clear track record of trying to involve, um, trying to bring Iran into the international community. That was the basis of the critical dialogue, the critical engagement, and arguably it was an abject failure. With regard to uh, this new security apparatus, the question is whether the Iranians are willing to do that. Uh, when one calls for the eradication of another state, it becomes a major problem. And we're not simply talking about Israel in this regard. One's also talking about Bahrain. After the two separate Iranian cells that intercepted in Kuwait, there's also a great fear in certain other GCC areas. There's a whole separate debate, which has really it augmented itself since 2008, about what the meaning of export of revolution is. Mohammed Khatami tried to say in 2008 that when Khomeini talked about export of revolution, he really meant that we should build ourselves up as a soft power utopia, that all the other countries would want to follow our system. And he was shot down by people in the Revolutionary Guard who said basically no. He meant that we should do this the traditional way, the old-fashioned way. And so the Iranian behavior, the resurgent behavior right now, seems to suggest that while it's all well and good to say that a solution's out there, neither the Iranians nor arguably um, many of the Arab states are interested. And if I may, one of the issues I forgot that I was going to say, it's not 4 a.m., is I was debating once with Daniel Kurtzer, who is an American ambassador, um, was ambassador to Israel and ambassador to Egypt. And this goes into play with regard to the nature of diplomacy and how to react to Iran. I basically argued that we shouldn't necessarily have diplomacy and a process for the sake of having a process. Sometimes part of diplomacy is simply doing nothing and letting the other side sweat it out. That's one pole of the debate, and you can disagree with that. What Daniel Kurtzer argued was, no, the reason to keep engaging in these processes is instead of waiting for an opportunity to happen, which you can seize upon in order to have conflict resolution, by engaging in a process, by embroiling the other side in a process, sometimes you can force the other side to make an opportunity for, for conflict resolution. I happen to believe that Daniel Kurtzer is wrong on that. It sounds good in theory. I can't really think of too many cases in reality. But arguably, that paradigm would fit into such a proposal, which it's a good proposal, but it would be active to debate. And I'm not sure the reality right now would allow that, no matter what the process is. Uh, very short. Um, I would support any step which would go in the direction of peace in the Middle East. No question. But I bring you some examples. When, because you mentioned Khatami. Uh, when uh, the discussions of uh, the Greater Middle East uh, was, Khatami uh, uh, made the opposite discussion and said, We want an Islamic Greater Middle East. He said, No, we don't want this Western democratic system for the Middle East. We want an Islamic greater Middle East. What does it mean? It does mean, again, uh, in a diplomatic uh, language, we oppose, and uh, Khatami said it many times, the West has to go out, out of the Middle East, as the revolutionary guards said it, and, but he said it in a little more, more diplomatic way. So, uh, the, the question is, what do we understand under peace? It is a very... So far we cannot even persuade the Islamists to uh, not follow their terrorist strategies. So, uh, which peace, I ask, ask myself, I, I ask you, even if you don't, if you can't as, uh, convince the Islamic, the leaders of the Islamic Republic, that they should give up the export of the revolution, which means the export of terrorists, which peace. 
So, and we know the fact that the Iranian understand not the Iranian, the, the, island, the, the island laws of this political system in Iran understand minorities. They understand only their own role model, which would bring peace. And it is another understanding of peace. If, if I may add, you, you quoted and you cited Muhammad Khatami in that issue because I, I had also cited him. But if we look at the speech by the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, on November 4th, 2009, the 30th anniversary of the seizure of the American Embassy, he also outlined the same themes. And therefore, you really can't argue that it's just a hardliner or a reformist sort of dichotomy. The Supreme Leader meant to end that discussion right there and then on the 30th anniversary, which was also seen as a speech to respond to President Obama's letter and offer an outstretched hand. It's, if you go to Khamenei's website, you can find the speech. Okay, so we have Sandy over there. Hello, my name is Andreas Binder. I have two questions to Michael Rubin. Um, you said something like uh, you're not sure if the Iranian government uh, already has decided if they really want to get the bomb or want to finalize this project. Um, in light of that, what, do you, what is your comment about uh, the last report of an Iranian opposition group, uh, People's Mujahideen, which have uh, detailed out about uh, 60 names of uh, scientists in Iran, which are working according to this report on high speed directly on the bomb. And second question, why is this group, which has provided in the last 10 years so much intelligence to the West and to the United States about the nuclear program, why are they still on the US terrorist list? And do you think that the actual government will change the situation for the elections? Or finally, will US courts force them, like the European Union court did European governments to take them off the list? Well, first of all, let me, uh, I'll, I'll, it's a very good question, and let me be very direct in response, even though it might be a controversial answer. I do consider the Mujahideen al Haq a terrorist group because they killed Americans during the 1970s. One can argue, and they trained with the PLO and so forth. One can argue they haven't done it since, but I would go further and say that even if the courts do force um, the U.S. State Department to delist them, from the state sponsors of terror, um, from the individual terrorist group designation, I think it would be tremendously bad policy to work with the Mujahideen al Haq. The way that Iranians, by and large, look at the Mujahideen al Haq, which were purged, they were defected, they went to work for Saddam Hussein, is the same way that Americans look at John Walker Lynn, the American Taliban, um, or Adam Gadan, who's the Al Qaeda sp English language spokesman. When I was in Iran, Iranians are very cosmopolitan um, and they will tend to speak, although they make sure that they can speak when you're not standing in a place still and so forth. Many Iranians would ask about all sorts, myriad opposition groups. But in my seven months in Iran, and I'm just going on my own experience here, I never found a person who asked, even surreptitiously, about the MKO and talked about them with anything other than antipathy. Now, when it comes to the MKO's intelligence successes, one thing that's important to remember is that Mujahideen al Haq has been tremendously inconsistent. That sometimes they have, I mean, for example, it's been about 10 years since they announced that, um, I think his name was Ahmed Bebahani, was discovered in a Turkish refugee camp, and that he was involved in the, um, in the assassination of Qasim in in Vienna, Austria, on July 13, 1989. The problem was he was about a foot shorter than the actual Bebahani, and it seemed that the Mujahideen al Haq had simply made it all up. Now, when the issue comes to the Mujahideen al Haq's revelations about Iran's nuclear program, one of the open questions which is out there is whether the Mujahideen al Haq is acquiring that information on their own, or whether any foreign powers are laundering information through the Mujahideen al Haq so that it's not directly associated to that foreign power. Regardless, I would say that in the future of Iran, the only thing that will rally Iranians around the flag more than bombing Iran itself would be working with a group 
that has such a long history of attacking other Iranians. We can disagree, but I want to just at least up front let you know what my thinking is on there, because it's a very policy-relevant question. And for better or for worse, I just want to be clear that I'm on one specific side of that. What about the report? Well, when have, when the, it's very easy to issue. It's very, there's a tendency, and I saw this when I worked in DOD, when sometimes documents would come that were discovered here, there, or elsewhere. The Mujahideen al khalq has a very bad tendency to issue reports with great deals of precision on the belief that the more precise the report is written, at least in details, the more accurate people will assume it to be. However, there's a track record of issuing very precise reports, which are fiction. And so in this case, at the very least, I would say, don't trust and certainly verify. Okay, so we have two persons down here. My name is Gabriele Jona. Uh, I have uh, to make a statement and a question as well to Michael Robbie. Um, I am not sure that Iran is really in a crisis. There are two very big supporters. You mentioned in your um, paper that North Korea uh, is working together with Iran. Would North Korea do this without a green light from China? I know that. And the second thing is, since centuries, Russia always looks to Iran as their area of influence. And the West, we are, maybe it is more our crisis in the West, but Russia, we can say, is also in a way supporting Iran, and it would not go so far as Europe and, of course, America. So I think the crisis, <laughs> I don't know if we can speak about a crisis in Iran. We have a crisis. Israel has a crisis at the moment. Maybe you can <laughs> so, say um, What I would say is, and, and actually uh, I'll let you talk a little bit more about North Korea because you brought this up, but North Korea has at various times acted against Chinese interests. One of the problems, I mean, when we talk about cost of diplomacy, we tend to address the North Korea problem through Beijing, and in many ways that empowers Beijing above and beyond where we need it to be empowered. All I'm suggesting is while diplomacy has benefits, there's also costs in terms of this, and certainly many Koreans, perhaps not North Koreans, but many Koreans are worried about the increasing Chinese rhetoric about the three kingdoms with an understanding or an interpretation that should North Korea's regime collapse, the Chinese would want to annex the, um, the upper third of the peninsula, which is one of the kingdoms as they try to create this false nationalism. Now, I'm going to defer most of the talk with regard to North Korea to my colleague. With regard to the Russia-Iran analogy, I would argue with, um, I, would, I would agree with you that relations between Russia and Iran, in my memory, have never been so great. Um, because the videotape is rolling, I cannot give specific names because this would be much more of a discussion for background. But I talked to a very specific, Rush, um, a very senior Russian official who had responsibility for the Middle East account. Whenever Iran, get, I mean, relations between Russia and Iran aren't as good as people believe. Whenever Iran starts to get out of hand, the Russians talk about revising the Russian-Iranian treaty of the first um, decades of the 20th century, and that shuts the Iranians up right away. And the Russians still find that they have to play hardball. What worries me about the Russians is that whenever the Kremlin believes that they're in a win-win situation, it's really not good for international security. On one hand, the Russians believe that they can make a great deal of money by selling nuclear components and weaponry to the Iranians, and that's a win from the Russian perspective. On the other hand, if there is, if this does escalate to a military crisis, the price of oil is going to increase, and from a Russian perspective, that's a win. I'd argue that that's the reality of the world that's a problem with Vladimir Putin when one walks into the United Nations. It doesn't make people put away their realist national interests and suddenly embrace the founding statements and principles of the United Nations. 
with regard to whether there's a crisis in Iran or not, look, I mean, we can engage in all sorts of moral equivalents. It would be the Iranians going back to 2001 who have repeatedly talked about the use of, um, about the possibility of constructing nuclear weapons. Likewise, after 1994, after the Rwanda genocide, international law put together, I believe, a five-point test about incitement to genocide and what that constitutes. It's something that uh, former Prime Minister Howard of Australia thought a great deal about, and it seems that the Iranians, when it comes to the issue of incitement to genocide, fulfill that political science international law test. Um, maybe one could say, well, that's just the rest of the world's problems. I'm not willing to go there, but if you want to add about North Korea. Uh, well, sure. Uh, not North Korea. It was one article that was published in, in the Belt, and I uh, referred to it, uh, where Hans Wilde wrote his famous article and reviewed this story. No, but uh, uh, more important uh, is, of course, uh, the Iran and Russia. Uh, relationships, you know it. Uh, you were busy with Iran and this is exile. Uh, I remember in the 80s. Uh, and um, um, you know that uh, Iran were two times in war with Russia in the 18th century. So the first anti colonial activities of Iran, if you could call it anti colonial <coughs> activities, from um, the religious side were anti-Russian, anti-colonial activities, not anti because uh, in that time the uh, uh, Britons were not active in Iran. But they, so uh, there are big uh, problems between Russia and Iran in the Iranian history. But now they are now they are not a real consensus. It is a sort of question of who is my friend and who is my enemy. What, what I would say, if I may just interrupt for a second, I believe it was in Asfi, Iran, there was actually an opinion article published in Iran about maybe we should allow the Russians to have military bases in Iran, and the rapidity with which the comments that Iranians wrote underneath this article, berating the, the newspaper, arguing for it to be shut down and so forth, for suggesting, for forgetting that if Russian imperialism was just amazing. I mean, there's still that, the governments may have a working relationship right now, but the people seem to um, have continued traditional enemies. In, the, in these questions, they are very pragmatic. They, they think, okay, who could, from which side we could uh, pro have more profits from the Russian side or from the Americans, from the West? So uh, it is a mere calculation uh, from the Iranian side. Uh, and uh, that Iranian side is not the side. Um, but um, what made me a little bit uh, um, sad is uh, when you say um, the Iranians are, I mean, we have to deal since 33 years ask an Iranian if he feels free in his country. So I don't understand how you can say, no, uh, the Iranians have no problems, we have here problems, and Israel has problems. No, we are in, of course, in democracies, uh, everyone can articulate if he has uh, a problem or not. In Iran, we have a totalitarian dictatorship where the people cannot even speak about their problems. So, uh, and they have more, you know, I, I quote only, to give you this as one answer, uh, one of the famous sociologists of Iran. He's a specialist of Iranian culture. He were here in the World Conference and he went back. He's in Iran. He was, he was very active in the Shah side, even in the Khomeini side. And under this regime, he was a professor at the Iranian, uh, the Tehran University. But he wrote a book here in exile, and it is published in Farsi. And he writes that Iran was never in the so. Um, uh, a bad situation in this history of 3,000 years than now. Never. So, uh, it, it is very hard to hear that you think that the Iranians have their freedom and only me happy. Yeah. I spoke about the nuclear, the nuclear weapon, that they don't have problems with it, with not human rights. 
Oh, actually, let me address that. Oftentimes when the Iranians address the nuclear issue, they phrase it in terms of, do we have the right for nuclear power or nuclear technology? And overwhelmingly, Iranians will say yes to that. In 2006, there was a Tehran-based think tank which did a poll, and for this I'm citing Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, in which they asked the question, would you sleep more soundly if the Iranian, if the Islamic Republic had nuclear weapons? And two-thirds of the people said no. That think tank was subsequently closed down. So when we're talking about Iranian nu nuclear weapons capability, we need to actually parse the words. One other issue I would bring up uh, with regard to whether China is blessing all of this. At the end of the Bush administration, as you know, Bush's legacy was more or less in tatters. The Iraq war wasn't going well, Afghanistan wasn't going well, and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice decided to really give Bush a legacy, um, or to try to. And she pushed through this idea of very rapid rapprochement with North Korea. Part of the basis of that rapprochement was removing North Korea from the state-sponsored terrorism list. And here we go to the gentleman's um, comments, openly acknowledge that the state-sponsored terrorism list is a highly political document. And it, it, it's, not, it's not a political. One of the issues was we said that North Korea, Condoleezza Rice said, North Korea has not engaged in terrorism for quite some time, um, after the 1983 Rangoon bombing and the 1987 bombing of the Korean air uh, that had been leaving Sharjah or Iraq or wherever it was leaving. However, according to the Congressional Research Service, which as you know is the Congress's library, and it's strictly apolitical and it's, it's not even bipartisan, it's just simply not political. They had documented quite a bit that North Korea was very involved with Hezbollah and with the Tamil Tigers, both of which I think we can agree are terrorist groups. Hezbollah, North Korea was the country which helped Hezbollah build its underground bunker, bunkers in such a way that Israel fell for the, the diversions but didn't know where the actual bunkers were. The question, just to flip the question back to you rhetorically, is whether then China had blessed North Korea's action in this regard. And I would suggest that either, we, there's two possible answers. Either China did, in which case perhaps we have a much bigger problem with China than we realize, or North Korea is acting more autonomously than we would care for to, to operate. Okay, one, one, one more comment. One more comment. comment. Uh, because he said only on nuclear issues. Um, uh, I would uh, like to refer to a dispute between Musabi and Mir Hossein Musabi and um, uh, Ahmadinejad in the Iranian TV. I saw it in the videos. And a uh, few weeks later, Musabi got under house arrest. But what did Musabi say? Musabi and Mir Hossein Musabi criticized Ahmadinejad. You are playing with our national interests. You are endangering our national interests, uh, which, with all these issues, no nuclear program, and so on. So it is not true that our, I mean, it is the Iranian propaganda, and we are used to our newspapers and our diplomats repeat the Iranian propaganda. All the Iranians are behind the nuclear program. Who says it? Even Musabi criticized on this issue Ahmadinejad, and he got a few weeks later under house arrest. A hardliner in the 80s who was responsible for the murdering of thousands of Iranians. And Iranians uh, uh, have problems with, I don't know, many things, but I don't uh, think that they forget always the history. They know who Musabi was. And uh, I'm sure that they will remember it later. So now we're going to integrate a few more into the debate. This lady over there. Robin hat schon angedeutet, dass die Sanktionen sehr, äh, eine sehr wichtige Rolle spielen bei ähm, für Iran bei äh, seinen Vorhaben, in den klaren Vorhaben. Ich habe letztes Jahr 2011 äh, über sieben Monate in Iran gelebt, auch beruflich. 
In diesem Jahr war ich auch über einen Monat in Teheran, auch wieder beruflich. Und was ich so festgestellt habe, ist die Wirkungen, die die Sanktionen wirklich auf Iran und iranische Wirtschaft und Iran, iranische Meinung äh, hat über diese ganzen Jahre, seit es angefangen hat, sind nur die Punkte, die ich jetzt hier aufzähle. Ähm, erstens, die, die Geschäfte äh, sind weiterhin noch da, die sind nur schwieriger, die laufen jetzt über dritte Länder, das heißt Nachbarländer, Irak, äh, Kurdistan, Türkei, die Geschäfte funktionieren weiterhin, wenn es darum geht, dass die involvierte Personen Kapital haben oder Beziehungen haben. Das Negative ist dabei, dass es viel Zoll und Steuern hinterzogen werden, was in einem normalen Geschäft natürlich nicht möglich wäre. Das heißt, Schwarzmarkt, illegale Geschäfte sind mehr und mehr und irgendwelche Tricks, also dritte Kontos öffnen in der Türkei, in Kurdistan, in Irak, Kontos öffnen mit Namen von Menschen, die in Europa leben, das sind alles Aufforderungen zu äh, Trinkerei. Und einfache Hochschulabsolventen, wenn sie aus der Universität rauskommen, was haben sie da für Optionen? Sie können, wenn sie Gründungsideen haben, Erfindungsideen haben, haben sie keine Chance, das durchzusetzen, weil sie überhaupt gar keine, die haben ja kein Kapital, sie können jetzt selbst nicht dafür sorgen, ihre Idee durchzusetzen, bleibt ihnen also übrig, ähm, entweder Importeure von chinesischen Ware zu werden, das ist jetzt typisch in Iran, dass Jugendliche, in, weiß ich nicht, die fangen mit 18 Jahren an, bis ältere Herren, die mit, mit 70, die sind Importeure, die sitzen an der Ecke an der Straße und verkaufen chinesische Ware. Oder die, äh, die etwas Geld sammeln können, wandern ins Ausland, versuchen ihr Glück äh, im, im Ausland. Oder die werden mit Depressionen und Drogen und äh, zum Schluss mit Selbstmord äh, irgendwie hantieren. Aber was wer am meisten an diesen Sanktionen profitiert, sind gerade diese Revolutionsgarde. Diese Macht, die die Revolutionsgarde heute hat, hat sie durch die Sanktionen erobert. Und das ist schrecklich traurig, dass man das auch so noch verteilen kann. Die komplette Macht der Revolutionsgarde kommt daher dass sie Geld haben, dass sie Beziehungen haben, dass sie Konten haben und die komplette Geschäfte, wirtschaftliche Geschäfte jetzt nur noch in ihren Händen waren. So, bleiben nur noch die Bevölkerung. Welche Wirkung hat, haben diese Sanktionen auf die Bevölkerung? Die haben tagsüber von morgens 6 Uhr bis nachts 10 Uhr zu kämpfen für, wie nennen das in Deutschland, Eurojobs. Die kämpfen nur, damit sie ihr Land über das Wasser halten. Was bleibt Ihnen an Mut, Energie überhaupt gegen diese Regierung zu kämpfen? Die meckern, sie sind froh, wenn sie einfach gemeinsam sitzen und ein Abendessen haben und eine Musik hören. Und dann sind sie glücklich. Ich glaube nicht, dass wir das mit den Wahlen in 2009 noch mal erleben werden, wenn wir so weitergehen. Die Hälfte ist klar. Das ist der Weg. Okay. Thank you for your statement and I will try to summarize it in English. Uh, she was talking about sanctions, which we um, um, uh, refer positively to as a, a, as a means of getting the Iranian regime under pressure. She said that she lived for seven months last year in Iran and that what she uh, saw there was that, you know, there are sanctions, but, you know, uh, there are all kinds of tricks like third countries, uh, via which the um, uh, goods are sent to Iran, black markets, um, all other kinds of tricks that uh, students who leave university don't have a chance to, you know, start a business because um, everything is so under pressure from sanctions that uh, they have to also get into this black market, uh, some are desperate, they take drugs, etc, etc. So in the end, uh, that populations hit harder, pop uh, 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 the sanctions hit harder populations, but at the same time strengthens the elements like the revolutionary guards because they control the black market. What I would argue in response, it's a very good question. What I would argue in response is that, at least according to the official Iranian press, 
and that Iranians will sometimes write fairly openly, especially in newspapers like Dunya de Ektisad and economic, I mean, various economic newspapers. I mean, economics and that social science is something where Iranians seem to feel less restrained on how they argue points. While there's no doubt that Iranians will struggle, that with regard to the economy, Iranian mismanagement over the economy has done far more harm than sanctions have, and that seems to be something which the Iranian public is cognizant of. They tend to blame the government rather than the outside world. With regard to the Iranians avoiding sanctions, you're absolutely right, this is a problem. One does not want to have sanctions that are so comprehensive and punishing that you will destroy the economy completely as in Iraq. But at the same time, if you target sanctions too narrowly, there will not be a, um, they, they will not have much effect. The, the middle is, finding the formula in the middle is what's important. Rather than sanctioning specific banks, I argue that you can avoid some of the black market loopholes by sanctioning all of the banks. For example, with regard to the European Union, the European Union wants only to sanction, um, to have the SWIFT sanctions on banks which are designated um, by the United Nations and so forth. But the Iranians can shift banking operations so quickly, it's important to sanction all the banks, likewise to sanction the central bank. Ultimately, Sanctions have had some effect. In December, 40 members of the Majli signed an open letter calling for the government to have a closed session of parliament so they could discuss the reality of sanctions rather than just the rhetoric of defiance. At the same time, the head of Khatam al which is the economic wing of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, around the same time in the interview, acknowledged that sanctions were having some effect. But ultimately, we need to recognize that the regime tends to victimize the Iranian people, they are the people, I mean, they are the main victims, and that the only way in order to relieve the people of this would be to not throw a lifeline to a dying regime. I, I am not the Iranian regime, I sell that the people are suffering. I, I understand this, but sanctions aren't about copies and... Between two thousand, understood. Between two thousand, and that's a problem, especially because we allow the Revolutionary Guard too many loopholes. Between two thousand and two thousand five, however, during the height of the dialogue of civilizations, the European Union nearly tripled its trade with Iran. And during this period in time, when money was flooding in, people were not. The, the government wasn't investing the hard currency in ordinary people. They were investing it in the weapons program, which is why I suggested that a greater attention to the labor union movement to try to force the government to be more accountable to the people. Likewise, when I lived in Iran in 1999, I stayed at a, a hotel in downtown Tehran. I mean, not one of the top hotels. It was like a two or three star hotel um, near Medana um, Banat. At any rate, staying in that hotel was a young couple from Khuramsha who had a daughter who was 12 years old, and she was dying from cancer. And I got to know them over the course of the several weeks I was staying in this hotel. She was in Tehran for medical treatment. The, in talking to the parents, they said, look, ever since Khuram Shah was destroyed during the Iran-Iraq war, the government keeps building mosques. Why can't they build more hospitals so that we don't have to spend Naz's last days at a hotel in Tehran? I mean, ultimately, I think we need to hold the regime responsible rather than others. Now, if the problem is the Revolutionary Guard, here's one strategy debate we don't often talk about. There will be no regime change, no muddle through reform, so long as the Revolutionary Guard remains loyal to the Supreme Leader's Praetorian Guard. But at the same time, the Revolutionary Guard is not monolithic. In 2007, September 2007, Muhammad Ali Jafari, the new commander of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, implemented something he called the Mosaic Doctrine, where instead of looking at the greatest threat to Iran coming from the outside, he said that Iranian people are going to be the greatest threat. And he reorganized the IRGC so that there's one unit per province and two in Tehran. 
one of the big open analytical questions I have is whether those serving in those Revolutionary Guard units on a provincial basis are drawn from residents of that province. If they are, that suggests that the Iranian regime feels confident that given the order to fire on the crowds, on neighbors, on friends, on family, on schoolmates, the Revolutionary Guard would. But if the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps doesn't allow, uh, sorry, if the regime doesn't allow IRGC, IRGC recruits to serve in the province in which their families live, that's an indication that already the Islamic Revolutionary um, the, the regime doesn't believe that the IRGC is going to be completely ideologically loyal. Other strategies we need to discuss is how to fracture the lack of consensus within the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. One issue which isn't talked about much outside of Iran, but certainly, and you probably saw this, is talked about in Iran, is the tremendous disrespect which the Iranian government shows to wounded veterans of the Iran-Iraq war, the lack of support and so forth. There was a big survey back, I believe, in 1997, in which in certain neighborhoods of western Tehran that the press said many Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps members lived in. Sorry, not 19, uh, in 1997. Muhammad Khatami got 70% of the vote. It was actually a misreading of the survey. Most of the people living in that area were not currently serving Revolutionary Guardsmen, but actually the widows and the families of wounded veterans. And there's issues like that, that if we can learn what the fissures are in the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, we can address the very real problems which you highlight. But I would suggest that the answer to the suffering which goes on in Iran is first, not to, not to relieve the Iranian government of the primary blame, at the same time not simply to fund them and eliminate sanctions. Thank you. Okay, so now we have Daniel and Sama. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. This has been a very insightful evening, but um, I have one question which really startled me. Um, you say it's two weeks from a weapons capability um, to developing weapons. Could you just elaborate on that in two or three sentences? Yeah, I mean, basically, a nuclear weapons capability is having all the components ready to go, and you just need to put everything together. And you can say that you don't have a nuclear weapon. All you're doing is building various components and then it's assembly line. This is where Japan is. I mean, no one doubts that Japan, Japan can make a nuclear weapon. No one doubts that they probably would run the computer simulations to figure out how it goes, but do they have a nuclear arsenal? No. We have to be very, very careful in what we determine as a red line, whether it's a nuclear weapon or whether it's a nuclear weapon capability. All I am arguing is while these two things seem to be very, very different, in the public debate. In reality, they're not that different at all. And if there's one thing we can agree on, I hope, it's that not only the United States, but Western Europe have a very, very bad record of human intelligence inside Iran. And we simply probably will not be in a position to know when this decision is made until Iran announces or tests a weapon. Um, yeah, thank you to both of you. It was great to, to listen to you. And my question goes um, to Michael. Looking from an American perspective uh, to our um, policy and, and debate in Germany and knowing uh, the Middle East very well, what would be your advice to, to us, to, to us journalists, activists who are trying to change that debate uh, in, in Germany, trying to change that policy uh, in Germany? I mean, there, there have been some changes. Uh, people who uh, refused to, uh, to admit that sanctions are having an effect uh, on the regime um, for years um, and years are now um, admitting that uh, there is no other way than, uh, than doing this uh, and, and many other things uh, have changed which is great news but what, what would you suggest to us and advise to us to speed up that, that process? Well, let me put it this way because it seems that the Americans have, uh, under the current administration, adopted more or less the European approach to diplomacy. One, so I'm going to speak much more generally than being condescending on my first trip to Berlin after spending just a day and a half here already. 
to offer advice to the German government. I don't know the ins and outs of German um, politics enough to do that. However, one frustration I have, much more broadly across both Europe and the United States, the public debate, the political debate, and the business community debate, is this idea that the choice which we have in front of us is either addressing Iran's arguable nuclear weapons ambition, at which will, of course, whether it's through sanctions or other means, drive up the cost of oil at the time when the world economy is especially vulnerable, or maintaining the status quo and keeping oil levels manageable. I would argue that that is a false dichotomy that we have to shake ourselves loose from. The Iranians, I mean, this past, past few months, have threatened to close the Strait of Hormuz, and it's nonsense. They don't have the capability to do it for more than a day. It would be cutting off, the English expression is it would be to cut off their nose to spite their face because they need to import oil and so forth. But if they have a nuclear weapons capability, or let's say a nuclear weapons deterrent, then what is the more extreme elements of their rhetoric, they can actualize. And that could be a disaster for the world economy. What I would suggest right now is the status quo is collapsing. And so we need to have a serious discussion about what path we move forward to reestablish a new status quo. Okay, we have some more time for more questions over there. Hello. First, I want to introduce myself. My name is Sivan, and I'm a part of the coming down of program. I'm a volunteer in Germany, and I'm in Israel. And I guess that I came here because I wanted to hear more about Israel and about your personal opinion how the crisis in Iran reflects Israel and the perception of Israel in Europe and all the other world? Um, what I would just say in response to that, and I'm sorry to avoid your question, is first of all, I tend to look at the issue on my day-to-day -day job through the prism of American foreign policy uh, rather than Israeli policy. I actually get, I, I guess I'm not a very good Jew because I tend to go to Saudi Arabia, Beirut, and Damascus much more frequently than I get to go to Israel. Um, and because of that, I'm really not in touch with Israeli policy making. I've spent exactly one day in Israel in the last seven years. And so when it comes to issues about how Israel is looking at this, um, I'm not the person to answer that question, nor am I the person to give the European perspective, because very decidedly, again, I focus on the American perspective. The one point I would make is that there are different threat assessments out there which we need to be cognizant of. The Israelis look at the Iranian nuclear program in terms of being an existential threat. Now, Israel is a democracy, so you will always find people who will say, no, it's not so big a deal. But especially among the current government right now, which is probably unprecedented in the breadth of representation of the Israeli political spectrum which it encompasses. There is a feeling, a significant feeling that deterrence can't work. And I go back to the example I made about what happens if the regime collapses when Iran has a nuclear weapon, what they do. The Americans will look at the issue in terms of strategic tenability. If Iran develops a nuclear weapon, it's not going to mean the end of the United States by any means. However, it's going to make life much more difficult. Uh, the Iranians are going to throw their weight around for prestige and other reasons in the Persian Gulf, in Bahrain, where we have the U.S. Fifth Fleet. I was privileged to be in Bahrain in February and got tear gassed for my efforts and rubber bulleted. Um, it's going, there's going to be a cascade of proliferation and so forth. And the Iranians, I believe, instead of dropping a nuclear weapon, would use it as a deterrence um, and we would go back to the dark days of the 1980s when the Quds force was really running amok. One issue that we didn't talk about today, by the way, is the possibility that Qasem, Qasem Soleimani may have political ambitions in the presidency. Um, if we're looking at why he's developing such a public personality cult, which one normally wouldn't expect from someone who's the head of a shadowy organization. And for that, I'm actually chan channeling the concerns of the Kuwaitis, the Bahrainis, and the United Arab Emirates. Now, the Europeans will tend to look at the Iranian nuclear program in a different way. 
the Iranian nuclear program filed is the first foreign policy, international foreign policy problem which the European Union took the lead on outside of the European Union itself. And part of the reason why the European Union was pursuing the Iranian nuclear program the way it was in trying to resolve this problem was because they wanted to show that American notions about unilateralism and cynicism to international organizations and diplomacy in general was a mistake, that the multilateral European internationalist approach could work. At the same time, the Europeans very much want to preserve the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And if Iran went nuclear and developed a breakout, it would more or less mean the end of the NPT. So you have three different, <coughs> different perspectives. And even though I don't think that bombing could work that well and it wouldn't do more than delay, if you're Israeli and you're faced with what you consider to be an existential threat, and this goes back to the issue not of ordinary Iranians, but whoever has the command and control of that nuclear weapon and the ideology of that person, then even if the solution is only a 15% solution and not perfect, if you believe that the 100% existence of your state is at stake, then one has to act. So we also need to be very, very cognizant that if the Israelis don't appear convinced that diplomacy is serious, that if the Israelis believe that the goal of making a deal has trumped the substance of that deal, then we actually risk making the region much more unstable and bring the situation much closer to a military conflict. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Okay, more statements or questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's very good that you actually mentioned the um, uh, U.S. foreign policy or the Jewish strategy of the United States. Um, I found it very interesting that you mentioned that, well, you know, let me put it this way, a Saudi Arabia, for, for example, um, you have a regime that is totalitarian and in many respects that also does not um, respect human rights. And so it is not really a problem for the United States of America simply because it follows the lines or follows the um, politics uh, given by Washington. Um, the nuclear power issue was never really an issue back in the 70s by Iran. I mean, the United States of America, France, and Germany actually sold nuclear technology to Iran during a time when the Shah was clearly a dictator and also violated human rights. It was never an issue about human rights or democracy or liberal values. It was more an issue that Iran would become a hegemon in its, in its region, independent or acting independently from the United States of America. So um, as such, because for the US foreign policy, having a peer competitor in the Middle East is simply not acceptable. Um, that in itself is the reason why Iran does not take the words coming out from, from the US and the seriously. And, um, yeah. Okay, it, it's very good points all around. Let me start with where I agree with you. I agree with you that Saudi Arabia is totalitarian, and I agree with you that Saudi Arabia is a real problem. I am not one who believes that the United States should be tied so closely to Saudi Arabia in fact, I would argue that the ideology of Saudi Arabia has been just as disruptive and noxious, if not more, than the ideology of the Islamic Republic. Now, I would disagree with you by saying that Saudi Arabia simply follows the dictates of the United States. If that were true, I don't know why Saudi Arabia kicked us out of the, um, I mean, forced our military out of Saudi Arabia, nor do I know why 15 out of the 19 hijackers were, were Saudi. Um, so there certainly is a great deal of tension between the United States and Saudi Arabia um, with regard to this. Now, ideology matters. You're, first of all, the Shah was a dictator. I, I, would, I don't want to get into a debate about who was worse. I think at this point, perhaps the Islamic Republic has exceeded the Shah in terms of some of the aspects of dictatorship, or at least copied the Shah. At the same time, 
the Shah, while the Americans, the British, and the French, and the Germans, supported the Shah's nuclear ambitions. The Shah simply didn't remain in power long enough to flesh out exactly what those nuclear ambitions were. Now, the, the um, ideology of the people who are wielding the nuclear weapons are a problem, and you can accuse me of inconsistency here. But rather than engage in widespread international moral equivalents that Malawi, South Korea, North Korea, Venezuela, Colombia, Cuba, everyone has the right to nuclear weapons. I'm not gonna go down that path. I would argue that the specific ideology of those who would command and control and have the custody of the nuclear weapons is a problem, is perhaps the preeminent problem with which we are, about which we are afraid to discuss. Going back to the issue uh, which Saba raised, one of the problems I think we have, both in the United States and Europe, is looking at the issue in terms solely of political pragmatism and not understanding the importance of ideology. And it's the ideology which makes the threat of an Iranian nuclear program so worrisome. And I'll go back there to what we were talking about before, um, which I guess Erwin Cutler has talked about a great deal with regard to the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide and what constitutes incitement to genocide. And that, I mean, you can Google it. There's lots of articles written about it. But Iran certainly seems to have gone down four, if not five, of the qualifications with regard to incitement to genocide and the fact that that country would then have a nuclear weapon after they have avoided completely. Let's go back to the basis of this. How did the crisis start? Because Iran refused to adhere to the safeguards agreement of, the non of its non-proliferation treaty accession. And that ultimately, going back, I mean, IAEA tried to solve it, Iran was defiant, so it got referred to the United Nations. Ultimately, if we, if we want diplomacy to matter, and if Iran is going to address this issue, they have to comply with what they agreed to do, and, and they not done. Uh, very short. Uh, I want to not deny that uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, a totalitarian state. That Saudi Arabia is a reactionary state which uh, support, suppresses its own people, but it is a traditional religious society. Iran tries, the Iranian society, at least since 150 years, to come into modernity. Iranian society, at least in the big cities, is a modern society, a half-modern society, it tries to get modern. And don't forget, more than 4 million Iranians had to flee Iran. So there are refugees everywhere in the world. The Saudi Arabians are not refugees, they remain there, uh, many of them. Uh, uh, so Iranian society, the totalitarian, when I speak, it is not only a term which, which I play, I mean it's, it is very seriously, Totalitarian dictatorships have special and big problems between society and the state. So, and, and the, in Saudi Arabia, even in, in Saddam Hussein, Hussein was not a totalitarian. He was a dictatorship, yes. But there is a difference between, um, for example, the Shah regime, which was Shah was a dictator, yes. Sabak was a terrible organization, yes. But uh, China too, but for example, China could come to a democracy. Uh, Argentina could come to a de democracy. South Korea could come to a democracy. They could. Uh, the, the dictatorships are very different to each other. So Iran is another system than other Islamic countries. I'm sure about this issue. I don't want to open now a discussion about. Uh, uh, different form of dictatorships, but uh, we should take this issue very serious. Okay, now it's already two hours uh, since we started, but I see still there are some people who want to say something, so uh, it's, it's okay if we go another 10 minutes. So, then, uh, I'm not sure. If you want to add something, just a quick follow up. Um, you, 
you just mentioned again the genocidal tendencies uh, within the ideology or within uh, Iran in, in general. Um, now you are actually contradicting yourself. Uh, you just, well, at the beginning of the talk, you said that you agree that the Iranian regime is not suicidal, not irrational, and the war drop the bomb on Israel because it has been stated that it's very rational, and also the policies that have been doing on the entire strategy of the Iranian regime has been very, very rational. Also, when we are asking when exactly the crisis started, um, other people could actually say the entire crisis really started after the unilateral decision by the United States of America to invade Iraq. And, uh, and in light of the regime change in Iraq or Libya, this completely logical, rational, why North Korea or uh, Iran are behaving the way they are doing, or the, the, the way they behave. Okay, with regard to the, um, the five-part test, which has been put forward uh, after Rwanda genocide, I mean, it involves issues such as referring to others as subhuman, as needing to excise them, medical issues. What I said very specifically is I don't think that Iran would go ahead and be suicidal. Others will talk about how Iran isn't suicidal, and I was showing how that logic breaks down. The other issue is with regard to Iranian aims, should they develop a nuclear weapon, I don't want to gamble with the lives of those people. Given the Iranian rhetoric, and we're talking millions of people, given the Iranian rhetoric, the, the consequences of being wrong, I'd argue, are too great to bear. With regard to Iraq, you simply have your timeline look wrong, because the Iranian nuclear program really got its stride running under Rafsanjani and under Khatami before the 2003 uh, invasion of Iraq. With regard to the Libya example, the Iranians can say, arguably, I mean, not arguably, the Iranians do say, that look at what happened to Gaddafi once he gave up his nuclear weapons. Therefore, we need to have this sort of arsenal, even though they don't admit that they want that arsenal, in order to pursue this. But the other lesson you can learn from the Libyan example is the idea of changing a rogue leader through dialogue is simply inane and it doesn't work. Perhaps the only way to end the rogue regime is to end the rogue regime. With regard to Gaddafi, after we struck the deal, Gaddafi went off and he plotted to assassinate the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. At the same time, we can argue about whether he tried to still continue to support the Abu Sayyaf rebels in the Philippines. On top of which, in the last days of the regime, according to economic report, uh, last week's the regime, the Economist and so forth, the Financial Times, they argued that immediately after Gaddafi came in from the coal, he started accumulating and squirreling away money and resources so that he could withstand another round of sanctions. Well, the question then is, what was he planning to do that would bring upon Libya another round of sanctions? The New York Times, the Daily Telegraph, the Independent, the Guardian and Human Rights Watch should all be mightily embarrassed for the way they describe Saif Gaddafi, who's now wanted for international war crimes, as the great white hope who was going to end dictatorship, who was going to end autocracy, and suddenly come in from the cold. With regard to Libya, what caused Libya to come in from the cold was the interception of the BBC China, the ship that was carrying North Korean weapons parts. And this shows that you really can't have serious negotiations towards an ultimate diplomatic solution if you don't also have the intelligence capability to back it up. Arguably, we don't have that with regard to Iran. And regardless, the Iranians have shown since the days of Rashidjani, not since 2003, that what exactly their goals were. I mean, certainly in 2001, December 14th, if I have my timeline right, comes before 2003, was when Rafsanjani suggested the Pukut's Day uh, Friday prayer sermon that one could consider dropping a nuclear weapon on Israel and get away with it. That raises a lot of concerns. <laughs>